And today I want to talk to you about metamorphosis. Look at me and say morph. morph. Look at yourself inside and say morph. morph. This idea of metamorphosis, uh, we, we at Ambassadors Worship Center, we're all about that metamorphosis. We're all about that caterpillar to a butterfly. We're all about that resonating at a higher level. We're all about you haven't really realized what's in you yet, but you should. You should realize what's in you. You should, re you should realize that. And in all honesty, uh, uh, Pastor Nell, Pastor Josh, and our elders, and everyone who's thinking about AWC, we've decided to make that message strong. What do you do at AWC? What do you do at AWC? Why is it here? Is AWC here to save the lost? Yes, all about that. Is AWC here to get people to go to heaven? Yes, we're all about that. But the big deal about Ambassadors Worship Center is that we want you to show up on earth before you get to heaven. <laughs> we want you to show up here. We want you to show up on this planet. Your dreams, your desires, your calling, that stuff that's in you, we want that stuff to come out. It benefits everyone when it does. So metamorphosis is this process of becoming. And I just want to walk you a part of this process of becoming because becoming is the real reason for your life. It's the reason you're here. To become why you were sent here. To become that person that was birthed inside you. Someone said to me one day that the oak tree, and I'm from a land of oak trees in Mississippi, oak trees, pine trees, we got everything down there, but big oak trees. And they said that the oak tree is in the acorn. So I cut one open. I ain't see no tree in there. I couldn't find a tree in the acorn. I busted open a lot of them. <laughs> I could not find a tree. Okay, that's simple to you, I know, but I'm just a simple guy. I could not find an oak tree in the acorn. And you can't either. That acorn is full of mess, unorganized, just mush. Because the acorn is an idea of what you could be. Until that acorn is in the right environment, it never becomes an oak tree. An acorn in a jar never becomes an oak tree. And a lot of people are sitting in churches of jars. And very few pastors have the guts to say to you, God ain't looking for no jars of acorn. He's looking for oak trees. He's looking to things that are mush and have just a design and is an idea, but he's looking for that idea to be planted in the right environment so that it becomes what it is. He is outcome-based. Y'all look good this morning. Y'all okay? He is outcome-based. And the, the most important outcome he wants is you. So here's a scripture that I'll use today. This, this definition, well, let's put the definition up first of metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a dramatic change in the form of, or nature or behavior of a person into a completely different being by natural or supernatural means. So the, the metamorphosis is when you change dramatically from one being to another. Hmm? Completely different being. You, you walked in a slug, you fly out a butterfly. Totally different form. Totally different abilities. Now, Metamorphosis is unscientific because there's absolutely no way that a caterpillar should be able to turn into a flying butterfly. But that's the whole point in coming to Jesus. Is allowing him to turn you into this bigger form of you. So this bigger form of you, and we can find it in the Bible. We'll find it in the Bible, even this Greek word. This Greek, word is, this Greek word is in the Bible in Romans 12, 1 through 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, you can read it with me. I beseech you therefore, brothers, brethren, by the mercies of God that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your? This is reasonable to give your slug, to give your caterpillar self to God. 
It's reasonable. It's not unreasonable. We're not asking you for too much. Uh Uh-oh. I'm not talking about coming to Jesus. I'm talking about giving up to Jesus. (laughs) Paul says it's reasonable. It's not outlandish. We're not asking you for too much. It's not extra. It's not beyond. It's the least that we could do. Now that he's made us to give ourselves to him, why do we do that? He says in the the next verse, now watch this world around you because everything is built so that you can can conform to it. Everything. So do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, perfect. Three levels of life. Good, good. Acceptable, perfect. And by the way you change your mind to be transformed is how you live good, acceptable, or perfect. Which one you want? (laughs) Which one are you satisfied with? People say a lot. They say, nah, I'm good. I'm good right here. I'm I'm good right here. Don't give me no pressure. Don't cause me to grow. I've grown enough. Right? Now, I, okay, so I stay up here, and my wife is teaching me. Martin, just stay in the pulpit. Stay right up here. What she means is, hey, Martin, don't go to lunch with nobody. Don't go golfing. Don't don't be sitting down and having fellowship. Because you make people mad. Because you can't golf without saying, what you called to be. They ain't trying to hear all that. She said, so just stay up here in the pulpit. I ain't going to eat no chocolate cake with you until and during that chocolate cake, I'm going to be like, what are you doing with your life? What's the last thing God told you? Pastor, can we just take a break? From what? What are we taking a break from? I mean, what are we resting really? What is that we work? What is that we breaking from? I take my vacations to go read. I'm gonna stay right up here, but I'm gonna tell you while I'm up here now. <laughs> while I'm up here, I'm gonna be talking to you. Now watch this now. The Amplified Bible is so much, so much gooder. <laughs> so much gooder. Watch what the Amplified Bible says. The, the Amplified Bible says it like this. It says, now, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. But be metamorphosized. Transform, that's the word. But be metamorphosized and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by renewing your mind, focusing on God's values and ethics and ethical attitudes. Why? So that you may prove for yourself that what the will of God is That which is good, read it, and acceptable, and perfect, where? So there's a good purpose for me. Good is like, you know, that's good. You got any children or anybody you ever helped before? And they do something and you say, that's good. That's good. Then you have someone you're helping or you see them respond and you say, wow, that's acceptable. In other words, I kind of I like that myself. It was good, but I can accept that. But then there's perfect, which is far above either of the other two. So I can go from caterpillar to butterfly, or I can go from caterpillar and die in the cocoon. And it all is based on how I renew my mind. Your body, write it down, my body responds to my mind. 
My body is, is, a, is an active participant in what my mind thinks. My body, my body is an instrument of my mind. If I do it with my hand, it bec- it's because my mind says it's okay. If I want to change, I don't change my body. Okay, if, if, if I want to change, if I want to change, I don't change my body. Every, every personal trainer, every, everybody in the... My, my, uh, doctors, people who deal with people physically, they would rather... I asked my doctor, I asked my doctor once, he was getting ready to do surgery on me years ago on my lungs. And I said, who would you rather do surgery on? Would you rather do surgery on a depressed person or a spirit-filled person like me? He said, I'd rather do work on somebody like you. He says, I'm not Christian, but you're in a good attitude. And I said, good, take my hand. Before you... Shoot, what you talking about? <laughs> I prayed for all of them. I told the anesthesiologist, I said, no, no, don't knock me out. I got to pray for you. I got to pray for that person over there on that respirator machine. I got to pray for that. I got to pray for all y'all. This here is my operating room right now. <laughs> I got to renew all y'all's minds before y'all put me under. Okay, y'all don't like that too much, right? That there is a place, there is a place where God gives you control over what's happening around you, and that's perfect. It depends on your mind. Whatever a man thinks, he is, he is. The Leslie. Whatever he thinks he is, that's what he really is. So he says, change your mind. I'm not going to be in a hurry. So watch this now. Watch this now. What we're really talking about is this renewal and restoration of God's original idea in you. This renewal, this going backwards. So the Bible says, the Bible says, repent, go back to the top. Repent. Go back to the top. Uh, Repent. Go back to the higher level of your thinking. Repent. When you were created, you were created God-like in the God class. Am I, did I, did I walk into a Baptist church this morning? You you were, uh, you you, you were created, I, I, I love my Baptist brothers, but this ain't, this ain't what that is. Okay, because everything's not going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. It's not going to be all right. It's not going to be all right until you decide. (laughs) So this this higher order of yourself, am am I still with you? This higher order of yourself is what's most important to God. Because that's how we serve him. So I want to talk about this process a little bit. And I want to use Moses for it. This, 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 this process. This, this process of God turning you into what he designs. It's the secret sauce of AWC. That we have to find out how to tell everybody. If you want to become, we the nation. If you want to become who you are, this is the best place to do it. If you're in a place of discovery for yourself and being a blessing to God, this is the place to do it. Denise said it so wonderfully. Ron said it so wonderfully. Joshua finally said it last week. We're trying, y'all. We're trying our best to couch you in the perfect situation. Am I making sense? So let's talk about Moses a little bit. Write Write this in your notes and just say, just live your life. Just live your life. Let me take off the pressure from you to do anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be super spiritual. You don't have to go on a trek where you're trying to find God. Just live your life. Keep doing what you've been doing to the best of your ability. Because the Bible says that when God found Moses, it said that Moses was tending the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law. He was just doing his job. 
He was just doing what was right in front of him, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock back to the backside of the desert. He'd always been there. And he came, he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He came to the place where God had already showed up before. He didn't, he didn't know about this place and I can't get stuck there. He didn't know about the place. But he showed up there and God was still there these, these years later. When he, got to Mount, when he got to Mount Horeb, write this down. Y'all still with me? Just, just, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't be bothered by it. This next thing, write down. There's an angel on my path. That's why you can just keep doing what you're doing. Don't be frustrated. Don't be weirded out about it. I miss God. You can't miss God. I missed him. He'll come back around and find you. <laughs> Anybody ever been in a place in your life where you really messed up? <laughs> okay. The ones you that don't have your hands up, you're lying. I mean, you know, you, I'm not telling the truth. You really messed up and there came a day the presence of God found you again. Yeah, you can't get lost from God. He, he is everywhere all the time. So watch this now. There are angels on your path. Just keep doing what you're doing. In the, in the second verse of the third chapter of Exodus, this is what it says. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. One angel. Don't want to go through this all the way through scripture. But the moment you were born, the angel created for you before time began was at your bedside. He will give his angels charge over you to keep your feet from stumbling. There are angels that are assigned to you, created for you. They never lived. They will never die. They never go away. That's why you didn't die in the accident. That's why that thing didn't take you out. That's why, because there are angels on your path. You can't see them. You can't feel them. They may not talk to you, but they keep your feet from stumbling. Every now and then, your angel will say, don't go that way to work. Mm -mm. I know you're lonely and in the club, but don't go home with him. <laughs> you might not come out of this alive if you go over there. Two jobs in front of you and in your inside and right behind your eyeballs. You hear God saying this one. And you're like, mm -mm, that don't pay enough money. He says that one. Angels are helping you and guiding you. And you find out now you're in the right situation to become. The angel appeared to him. Here's the issue. The angel appeared to him in something unusual. It was a bush in the backside of the desert that was on fire. Moses has seen bushes all day on fire. If you know where Horeb is, if you've ever gone to Israel, Horeb is a horrible place. It's, it's desert. It is dry. It is arid. And you'll, a bush will just automatically combust and burn. That's not special. There was something special about this bush, and this is what you're going to see as you're becoming. This is so good to me. This is what you're going to see in your life as you become. You're going to see this thing, not just these angels on your path, but you're going to begin to see something that's different about the bush. In other words, in other words, God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're doing, and you've got to learn the power of your pivots. You got to understand the power of your pivots. Pivots. Don't turn unless you see something like a burning bush. You keep your face set toward the thing God has for you. Do not get off your path. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Don't let circumstances rob you of an opportunity. But if you see something weird like a burning bush, it's time to pivot. It's time to turn. When, you, when you're hearing God, the still small voice, Something strange in your mind and in your spirit. It's God beginning to work on you to show you and open your eyes and open your heart to something that may seem new. May not even under, you may not even understand it. But that's how God causes us to become. What do you do when your children, you've, they, they've now said, God... Uh, daddy, I want to be saved. Okay, son, I'll lead you to the Lord. Daddy, they grow up. They say, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You lead them to being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then one day they come to you and tell you something. Your children, they tell you something. You say, I didn't see that coming. I don't know nothing about that, son. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Well, you got to tell them. You know what? You got a relationship with God. 
We got to trust that relationship with God. It may be different from daddy's experience with God, but God is still working on you. I brought you into the world so that you could live. Why do I stay with my children? Why do I stay with my wife? Why do I stay at home? I stay at home, yes, because I love. Yes, because I'm in love. But more than that, I know the principle. If I stay with the woman of my children and stay there with my children, giving them a safe place to become, I do a better job for myself and the world. I'm not making any sense to y'all. I get it. Josh told y'all last week, he said, my daddy is country. He's from Mississippi. He don't even understand Omaha. I'm still trying to figure y'all out. <laughs> so I might as well be who I is, right? <laughs> so he says, Moses says, now I will turn. I will turn. Let me, let me, let me say this. God knows what you're looking for. Let me explain it. In your experience, let me, let me break this down for you. Why did Moses turn and look at this bush and not all the others burning in the desert? Listen to me. Because this bush was on fire but not being consumed. Uh-uh. Everybody in this room is looking for something you can get involved in where you can be on fire, but it won't kill you. Everybody, everybody in this room, you're looking for something when you can be ablaze. See, Moses was used to the bush being on fire, but eventually it just be smoke and ashes. Ain't nobody in this room want to give your life and then die out in it. Get burned up in it. Get consumed in it. Lose your mind in it. Lose your family for it. Lose your babies and your children. Get sick. Don't give me no gold-plated watch when I've killed myself for 30 years in your corporation. Nobody wants that, but Moses turned aside when he saw Pastoring won't consume you. I meet people who don't want to get married because they say building a family is too much work. But when you see the right girl or right guy, you'd be like, oh, I think I could do it with her. <laughs> she won't kill me. <laughs> he won't take me out. We're all, everybody is looking for an opportunity to be on fire. And not be consumed. Is that you? Is that you? Would you love to be on fire every day doing something you love? You don't have to be motivated to do it. Nobody's got to pump you up. Nobody's got to convince you. They don't have to offer you anything more. You're just happy. Oh, I'm just happy to be here. If y'all have never met a freak like this, Tina Seymour is a freak. Every time you see her at work, I'm, so glad, I'm just so glad to be here, Dr. Martin. I'm just so glad to be here. What y'all need? You need something? You need something over there? You need some coffee? You need me to sweep? You need me to do something? I'll lead praise and worship. I'll do all that. I'll do over here. I'll do that. She said, oh, I'm just as happy. I'm like, girl, sit down. Stop singing, little donkey. It's like, but it's this contagious spirit of being on fire but never consumed. If you're running a business and it's burning you up, might be the wrong one. Somebody shout it with me. You can tell after the first date. <laughs> if you're on fire with him or her on your first date, but you go home and you need a nap, wrong one. <laughs> But if you're on fire during that day or during that quarantine period and you go home and your mind is activated, your spirit is activated, your, your heart is activated, you feel stronger. And even after a few days, you text him or text her and say, you know, what were you, what were you thinking about that thing? And they text back and say, I just think that's a great idea. Let me give you three points. Somebody shout fire. Yeah. Everybody wants fire. But nobody wants to die 
Moses pivoted when he saw an opportunity to be on fire and never consumed. That's when you pivot. I'm too far along. I'm too far along. I'm too far along. Martin, you can't leave. You can't leave the athletic department. This makes no sense. You got the job you wanted. It's just been offered to you in Mississippi. It's in your major. You got a master's in this. You prepared for it. Now you're going to go, Pastor, how many people met with you last night? I said seven people. He said, you're dumb. This is a dumb idea. This is my friend, my old boss. He was in my face. He said, pastoring? He said, you know I'm not religious because Christians are crazy. This is my boss talking to me who's trying to hire me. I said, I know, but I said, I'm anointed for this. I pivoted. I pivoted from 26 years of school. A resume that was ready for the NFL. But I pivoted to this. And for 30 years, I've not been consumed. Yo, okay. Okay, not been consumed. If I had gone to the NFL, because I fuss at the TV all the time, and I call my professional guys. I call my coaches. I call my people who are managing players. And I call them, and I say, why are y'all allowing this to happen? I could have never done it. But this doesn't consume me. It consumes many, but it doesn't. I'm stuck here, aren't I? It consumes many, but it doesn't consume me. Ask your neighbor, are you being consumed or are you on fire? Which one is it? Which one is it? Are you being consumed? Are you on fire? Ask your husband, are you on fire, honey? Or are you being consumed by this thing? And girl, if you got a man... That's being consumed. But he's full of faith about something else God wants him to do. Make sure you're discerning because you don't want to mess this one up. It could be the right thing for him to pivot. It might be two, three, four years of struggle. But if he pivots into what he's consumed by. Or your wife. Is that good? Then let me move on. (laughs) tell somebody there's power in pivots there's there's, there's power in well I just feel like I don't know but I mean I, I mean I can't explain it to you but I just feel like I'm supposed to do this I don't really understand it see angels on your path Brought a pivot in front of you. Introduced, opened a door, a question. Somebody just asked, have you ever been interested in? Now, here's an important point here. You've got to come to the place where you will submit to vulnerability. This is God developing you. If you're ever going to become, y'all, you're going to, you, you getting ready to live a period of your life scurred. Now, okay, I'm talking about not scared, not afraid, <laughs> pee in your pants. Depressed. Lonely. In a crowd of people. By yourself. Listen, listen, listen to what God says to Moses. Please, please understand this. If you're going to become, there's no one who didn't become that did not go through this process. Anybody who ever became who they were had to go through this. And listen, my people, listen, my people, listen to me, please. This world right now 
are they're building systems so that you never have to think which steals your resilience it takes away your fight it takes away your belief in yourself mr bezos said three months ago in a little while you'll never have to leave your home and never have to think and you will love it he said i'm gonna take over in such a way you'll never have to think i'm gonna use your phone to tell you what to order it will order it for you we know you're out of toilet paper and you can just stay at your home and never think so now people who never think and never come against walls i'm we're in the caterpillar stage i'm in the cocoon people who never have to struggle as soon as they hit something they stop they like oh okay the resilience from our children who don't know how to take what happens to them once they leave the house bullying was getting really famous when my children were in school dad my teacher said I just got bullied today really son you got bullied what did the teacher tell you to do and I love teachers I was raised by a teacher so don't mess with, don't mess with the teachers right I was simply trying to understand the process what did she tell you to do what well, she told me to do this come by and, da, 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 da. and I said okay what do you want to do I don't know he said I said did you feel bullied he said no I said then you weren't okay 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 you weren't bullied then going back to school <laughs> you go back up in there and be you well well what did they say well they said I was short you know they said I was fat they said I had a reading issue I said did that bother you he says no I am short I am a bit overweight and I'm learning how to read I said go back to school then okay 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 uh-uh you should have stood up he was being bullied no I want him to fight whether I'm there or not I want him to believe in himself whether I'm there or not don't let the world build some system around your child so by the time they're 12 they've given up they don't know how to stand in front of somebody okay the problem is you we're creating kids who need somebody else to do something for them and everybody's doing something to them did you feel like he did something to you mm -mm. then he didn't <laughs> go about your life y'all can't deal with me up here in AWC can you you can't, you can't deal with me, huh? Huh? Y'all can't deal with that? Look, it's, it's, it's this. Okay, let me just stay right here. This is what he said. He says to Moses, the way you're walking ain't going to get through there, Josh. So what do I need you to do? I need you to take those shoes off because this thing you walking in Moses you're not gonna get you're not gonna become the guy I want with them shoes on <clears throat> these things right here in the Bible they mean so many things they these shoes are your protection from stones from These shoes protect you from scorpions, things that can bite. When Ruth needed to go serve Naomi, her kinsman redeemer threw his shoe in. Your shoe is your voice. The shoe represents your rights. Your shoe tells us the sole of your shoe the corners of your shoes tell us where your path is God says I want you to give up your own path 
I want you to give up your protection of yourself. I want you to give up your right to speak. Well, I have an opinion. All these silly people during this last election cycle showing their opinions online. I'm like, what immaturity? You're a kingdom citizen. You don't have shoes. You don't have an opinion. What do you think? Which side are you on? I don't take sides. I'm above all this crap y'all trying to tell people. Oh, I'm sorry. I got Republicans and Democrats up in the church today. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Just tell your neighbor, take those off. Give up your path, Moses. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Don't tell me your creator what you're called to do. I believe I'm called. No, I ain't asking what you believe. When, pe when people tell you, when they use the word I a lot, <laughs> that means they're not listening to God. Give up your own protection. Yes. Martin, this is going to hurt. On this path, you're going to walk into some stuff. Trying to pastor a church instead of doing sports administration, you're going to mess up a lot of times. And in church, they will tell you on their way out. <laughs> now, they're not going to look at you now. They're not going to look at you. They're going to send you a... You know, a text message or an email. But <laughs> they're going to tell you how you messed up. Which I welcome most of the time. Because a lot of it is true. Pastor, you pushed too hard. Dang, that's right, I did, didn't I? I pushed you. I, I did. I pushed you. So I had to start thinking. These people sitting in the purple chair, they don't mean what they say. This is not, they don't mean it. So I had to learn. It took me a minute. When people say, Pastor, I want to grow. They don't mean that. No, no, no. You can't believe that, Josh. Uh, Pastor, I make $50,000. Can you give me three points so I can make 100? They don't mean that. They get up at nine now. And I'm telling you to get up at six. And do these things. They don't mean it. So the next time I say, uh, a month later, have you been getting up at six? Oh, you know, Pastor, such and so. Next time I see, have you been getting up at six? Well, you know, Pastor, such and so. You know what? Then they text me. You know, Pastor, I'm just not being fed here anymore. Oh, because you told me you told me you wanted to grow and become I showed you how now it's my fault y'all don't want to come to church this morning y'all don't want to come to church this morning so let me just finish fussing I had to go back to my training in sports I had to go back to training in sports that when people would leave our program at the college, at the university, or even when I worked for the Olympics, they would always blame the coach. Coach didn't let me play. Coach didn't believe in me. Coach liked this guy. Coach was racist. I'm going to tell you something right now. Coaches like to win. They, they don't care what color your skin is. <laughs> so now... People blame the coach. It's your path and your protection. When you blame someone else for something you should have done, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's proof you got your shoes on. Because God told Moses, the angel told Moses, 
If you're going to become, you got to take these off. You got to stop being offended all the time. You got to stop running. You got to deal with your lungs not be, being filled with air and your eyes almost go blind because you're jogging, you're working out. You've got to deal now with God telling you to do something that you don't feel prepared for. You don't have the skill for. But it's the art of becoming. Am I stuck here? Y'all okay with that one? Because God, this is what I read that helped me years ago. God said, Martin, be silent till they pivot. I get in trouble for that too. I emailed the pastor. He didn't email me back. He didn't, you haven't pivoted. Well, I emailed them three times and I, they sent someone else to meet with me. You haven't pivoted. How do I know? You don't serve here. You don't give here. You're not involved in anything. But you want me to sit down with you. You haven't pivoted. Can I say this? (laughs) Making up with her is amazing, so let me get in trouble. (gasps) Sometimes, brothers, you got to do it intentionally. What was I going to (laughs) say? I definitely forgot. I lost it just that quick. It's okay. I'll come back to it when I come back to it. Now that was funny. (laughs) When you take your sandals off, it's a recognition that you're talking to the Holy One. This is not common ground when God starts to deal with you about something. It's holy. It's hallowed. It's situations created for you so that you can become. Here's my next point. When, When God can see you take your shoes off, that you're submitted to his way of doing this, how he's going to get you there. This is what happens next. He reintroduces himself. Can I tell you right now, your concept of God, even mine, is wrong. None of us really see him for who he is. We're all struggling with that. People typically make God... They make God a God they like. (laughs) Watch this now. Don't be mad. But if you are, take your shoes off. People make God a God they like. Because if he's a God they like, then it means he likes them. And he likes the way they think. He likes the way they look at life. He likes the way they treat people. So they make this God, this picture of God, someone they like. So God now has to reintroduce himself to you. Because God don't give a flip about what you like. (laughs) 
He doesn't care. He doesn't care what you think. <laughs> he, 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 he doesn't care about what you're doing now. He doesn't care about your profession. So he says, now that you take your shoes off, let me tell you who I am. He says, I am God. You're not. <laughs> he says, I am creator. You're not. I'm the all-existing one. You're not. I'm the only thing that exists that was never created. You're not. <laughs> he says, I am, period. You've got to really begin to understand this thing about God. That God now has to adjust your perception of him. If you don't know as God, you're going to get tripped up like Moses is a few minutes later. Okay. Any mother in here ever had to say to your child, do you know who I am? <laughs> Why did you do that, mom? Come on, talk to me. Why did you do it? They forgot. Right. You have to reestablish yourself in this child's life. Why? Because they've been hanging out with some friend that cursed their mama out. <laughs> Someone said years ago, your children are so nice and obedient. I said, they are. We thank God for them and we beat them once a week whether they need it or not. <laughs> That's what's happening up in this house. We're going to call CPS, APS, A call them. Give them our address. <laughs> These are our children. We will discipline them. When I discipline him, it's better than having someone else discipline them on the street. I'm going to do that myself. What are the rules in Nebraska so I don't break them? You have to get back in their face and say, listen, my name is not Karen. My name's not Joanne. I'm your mama. I brought you in this world. This is what's getting ready to happen. And in one night, they straight. None of this, none of this. You call me what? By my first name, go sit in the corner. No, we ain't got no corner in this house. We, it's a round house. We don't sit in no corners. We don't sit in no corners. It's round. What did you call your mother? Linnell? And that's what happens to Chad. The Spirit of God comes in my house when they call their mama by their first name. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Because see, there's going to come a day that your mama is going to be the only one that's caring about you in the situation. Your father's going to be the only one that knows how to protect you. And if you're not in a place where you'll just simply obey. So you can't let them get away with it. I don't care how old they are. Can't get away with that. What do I call, what do I call you now that I'm married to your daughter? Mama, what do I call you now that I'm married to your son? Mama, <laughs> Papa, what do I call you now, God, that you've called me out here and now I'm anointed? My business is taken off, my ministry is taken off. What do I call you now, God? God, I'm not your friend, we ain't buddies. I'm the one that tells you what to do, where to go and when to go. I'm the one that gives orders and assignments. I'm the one that opens doors. I'm the one that closes doors. But as soon as I close the door, that means there's another one open. I'm God. Do I have your life or not? Some people want to know Jesus. I hear these messages and I'm like, it's beautiful. Do you know Jesus? 
Do you know Jesus? <laughs> Have you allowed him into your heart? Do you know Jesus? It's so nice. People say, yes, I want to know Jesus. So they lift their hands to come and know Jesus. Now they know Jesus. I know Jesus. Then a month later, Jesus says, I want you to do this. I bind you in Jesus' name. <laughs> you don't know Jesus till he tells you to stay somewhere you want to leave. You don't know Jesus. You don't, you don't know him. You don't, you don't know Jesus till he tells you to do something you can't do. You don't, you don't, you don't know, you don't know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't know Jesus. When you can afford a nice house in Mississippi, Alabama, Southeast, you can afford one. And Jesus says, stay. You don't know him. You don't know him until he tells you to do something that you don't want to do. And you do it. Because Jesus is all about coming. Y'all know it. Jesus step over in your life. You all goosey for about three days. And after that, he waking you up in the morning. Now, this is what I need you to do. I need you to do. Whoa, hold up, stop. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't sign up for all that. I, I didn't sign up for changing my life. I didn't sign up for doing stuff I can't do. I didn't sign up for something stupid and crazy and out there. I didn't sign up for that. That's not even my profession. I'm not even sure I know how to do that. I don't want to work with her. You don't know him yet. Let me move on. So Jesus has to introduce himself. Listen now. Be aware. Write this down. Be aware now as you're becoming. Be aware. Let's, let's get to this verse. Exodus 3, 7 says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Be aware as you're becoming. That God, there's some things on this earth God doesn't like. Be aware there are things happening here that were not his idea. Be aware that God wants change in our society. And he's not separated from it. He sees it. He sees people dying because they're not healthy. He sees oppressive systems. He understands them intimately, whether Christians do or not. God sees them. He's God. And he's not for or against anybody. Forget it. God is not some heavenly guido that stands for certain people and against others. He's not going to do it, even if you prophesy it. Yea, yeah, that said the Lord. Shut up. God ain't got nothing to do with that. This is God. This is God. I've seen oppression. I've seen it. I'm upset about it. Be aware. God is a God of purpose and passion. And that's why he's coming to talk to you. I'm getting there. That's why Moses, he's talking to you. Because he's a God of purpose and passion. And you've got to understand you must be resilient now. You can't give in or give up to a little thing because you're tired. Because you're worn out or because you don't know necessarily what to do. You've got to stay in this place where you're simply following God. Now watch, this gets really interesting. Can I move on? Be aware. God has seen everything. He sees it all. Now, next point is God God has a never-changing dream. God's never-changing dream is about these Egyptians, this, this place of, of, of bondage. God wants to give them a place of milk and honey. The ninth verse says, Therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up to me. And I have also seen the oppression of which the Egyptians oppressed them. Listen, something is happening around you or in you that God will begin to talk to you about. Nobody else may not be thinking about it, but you're going to be thinking about it. Why? Why is Moses thinking about oppression? Talk to me, Bible class. Why is he thinking about it? Because 40 years ago, 
40 years ago, he was serving under Pharaoh as an adopted son. What did he do? He grew up. He turned 18, 19. Actually, he was 40. He was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. At 40, he stood up and he said what? This is not right. He unlawfully murdered a, an Egyptian soldier. Right? So now God is simply talking to Moses about what's been bothering him all along. When God comes to deal with you, it won't be something outside of it. God's not going to come to me and say, Martin, I want you to start a business of underwater basket weaving. <laughs> really, God? <laughs> Really, God, you want me to do what? I want you to get snorkel equipment and get basket weaving materials, and I want you to go to the bottom of the pool with a camera, and I want you to make baskets underwater. Now, uh, that doesn't cause a rise in me anywhere. I don't like wicker baskets. <laughs> I would never make them. I don't, wouldn't go in a shop where they're being sold. <laughs> that has nothing to do with me. So what did he come to talk to me about? Sitting at my desk at the athletic department at the University of Nebraska. It was ignorance. It was people walking around campus with degrees but still didn't know who they were. It was students who were lost. It was men and women I hung out with on campus and in church and everywhere I went that there was this thing of we just don't know and we can't get the information. It was when I would sit in sermons. I'm, I'm an elder. I love the church. I love church. So I was at church all the time. And I got tired of me and everyone else leaving with the idea we just were told everything's going to be okay. That God's getting ready to do something. And I've been listening to my, that message for 20-something years. And it's not changing my life. It was this, is there any way we can build a culture where people can really find God, but really find themselves? Am I boring you? A, a place where they can really find out who they are. And serve God and us, human beings, from that place of where they know. Not becoming who they're not, but simply becoming who they are. When God showed that to me, I pivoted. Because that's what I think about every day. Y'all don't, don't know these guys, but Louis Lips, uh, Louis Lips, uh, I'm old. Uh, uh, rookie of the year, Pittsburgh Steelers, 84-ish, somewhere in there. Um, uh, Reggie Collier, uh, these football players in our athletic program at University of Southern Mississippi. I'm, I'm with these guys, amazing athletes. I'm telling you, if you get to see them up close, do their thing, you'll be like, this is a robot. That's not human. But when I'm talking to them, I'm like, you know, I, I know you're dating this girl. How's that working out? Is her father involved? Does her father know? Man, you're in my business. I know, but you, you're going to play in the NFL, and I just want you to, when you go there, I want you to have a good reputation. I want to talk to you about how fathers think about their daughters. What are you getting your degree in? Football. So you can't get a degree in football. I just want, I'm just going to do something. No, you got to get a real degree in case you break an ankle. See, that's the stuff I was talking about. <laughs> get what I'm saying? That's who I've always been. So that's why I try to stay up here. Don't invite me to your house. I'm not coming. Mm -mm. I want to know why you're living here. What's your dream? Do you know your net worth? Are your children happy here? Y'all don't like this at all. Bishop McLaughlin walked into my house. He came here to speak to our church. He says, take me by your house. I said, yes, sir. So I called Linnell and I said, Bishop's coming over. She says, does he want to eat here? He says, no, he just wants to come by, then we're going to go to dinner. 
got to my house. He kissed Linnell and said hello. And then he, Jesus on the main line. Then he says, uh, he says, where are your children? I says, they're up doing homework. He said, call your children down. Cal and Josh comes downstairs, little ones. And he asked them, he took out these $100 bills. He gave them two or $300 each, put it in their hand. And he said to them, he said to my, he talking to my kids. My mentor talking to my kids up in my house. I'm a grown man. He said, do y'all like this house? I was happy because I thought he was going to bless them or something. I'm looking at them and he's talking to them. He said, you like, I look at him like, what are you doing? He said, do y'all like this house? They said, yes. He said, what kind of house would you like better? Y'all, my kids start talking. <laughs> Want a bigger bedroom, a bedroom with the bathroom in it. It'd be nice to have, we had a pool. It would be nice. I'm like, He gave him that money, then he said, let's go to dinner. I am so disrespected. He said, your children, your children know and they're comfortable with telling you how they want to live. And he said, I want to know from you, what are you afraid of? I said, I'm not afraid of anything, Bishop. I said, I'm saving. I'm saving for their college. I'm doing all this stuff. He said, you're afraid. You're afraid that you can't provide for your family. And he said, you were never supposed to provide for your family. He said, that's God's job. He said, do you serve God or not? Shebo, sombrande, gesete. Hmm. Men and women who are raising your children, do you serve God or not? I had planned to come home and beat my kids <laughs> after dinner. I say beat them. I don't mean beat them. I mean discipline them. So Bishop Max said, don't you dare bring this up to your children. He said, you didn't know it, but I wrote down my number on those $100 bills and I gave your children my cell number. And as famous and as big as he is, he answers their call. Today. For two seconds, think about what everyone says you can't have. For five seconds, think about everything you're dreaming that looks impossible to you. For 10 seconds, meditate on what you don't believe you deserve, but you want. Hmm? That's what becoming brings to you. If you will allow God to work on you until your mind changes. Then you'll start to manifest the stuff he desires. Because the next thing that happened, I'll make this my last one. Put the, put the last one up there. The next thing that happened is that when God starts talking to you about something he either hates or loves, the next thing the Bible says is that God came down. Y'all don't, you understand that? God not only saw the problem, but he came down himself. He says, I have come down because of this issue. God interjects himself as he's talking to you. If you're ever going to become what God wants you to be and understand it and fulfill it and manifest it, you're going to have to understand that God comes down. Yes. He leaves his holy place 
to get involved in what he just showed you. I'll teach something else on Wednesday. So watch this now. Not only does he come down, but this next thing is what's shocking. What's shocking, put the, put the verse up. God says, I'm here, but you go. <laughs> Read it out loud. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people. Now, hold on. When God comes down, you celebrate, right? God is here. <laughs> Boy, God's like daddy when he walks in. Mm, my dad is here now. Let me sit back and see him rough this dude up. He doesn't do that. He doesn't take on Pharaoh. Can you tell me why God doesn't take on Pharaoh? Why doesn't God take on Pharaoh? He's made a decision not to. He put that in you. It's your assignment. He's not going to deal with Pharaoh. He's not going to deal with this issue. God's not going to deal with the issue of we can't get enough chips to put in cars. So now cars are 30 to 40% more expensive. God's not going to come down. He's going to come down, but he's not going to deal with that. He's going to give the idea to someone who can start making chips. He's not going to come down here to deal with obesity. He's going to come down here to deal with you so that you can deal with obesity. He's going to send you. Dude told me I was in Atlanta. He says, I see you going bald. I said, yes, sir, I am. It was funny. He said, you know, we can do something about that. I'm like, for real? What can you do? You going to put some stuff on that? He says, no, 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 no. He said, give me, give me an hour. I'll give you a whole afro. I said, for real? He said, yes. We take that, we shave that stuff off, we put some glue on that thing, and man, we cut it, won't well, nobody know nothing different. I said, well, my wife will. <laughs> I was laughing, but this guy was a millionaire by giving bald men hair. Jesus and do this go to the hospital God and heal the sick go and raise the dead God go and solve this financial problem for this business God and God says you go say it with me morph say it again close your eyes and talk to yourself just say it's time for you to morph say it out loud it's time for me to morph it's time for me to morph it's time for me to go to a higher level of myself it's time for me to realize something deeper that I may not have realized before it's time for me to develop that part of me it's time for me to take my shoes off this is not going to feel safe I'm going to step on some rocks. I'm going to be vulnerable. But I sure am not going to step someplace I, I know I'm not supposed to step. <laughs> I'm going to keep my feet until it's time to move. I'm going to follow God into everything he's assigned for me. Come on, come on, do that right now. You got a couple minutes. Do that right now. Do that right now. I know it's time for me to morph. Say it out loud, morph. Say it out loud to yourself. Tell yourself, morph. Say it with passion. Morph. We cannot help you out of that cocoon. If we do, you die. You never help the butterfly out of the cocoon. They build their strength getting out themselves. Their wings pushing against the walls. Their brain develops. Everything develops. They will only be able to fly because they push against it themselves. We can't cut you out of that cocoon. That is not what the gospel is about. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, y'all. 
the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not about cutting you out of a cocoon it is giving you strength to struggle there pushing against the walls of what has kept you bound and now is that time to push against those walls now's the time to wash your face and put some makeup on now's your time to struggle against old ideas now's your time to push down some walls that have been around you come on come on y'all come on y'all I got two minutes to work on this one come on don't get distracted focus on yourself now tell yourself to morph can you feel those constraints you feel those financial constraints you feel those relationship constraints you feel those restraints where people are not asking you for enough you're just getting by you're not giving your whole self you're not using your mind you're not using your strength you're not using your capacity you're not using your will you're, you're not really using it yet you can you can feel the outer core of what's holding you is holding your marriage don't give up on it yet work those wings don't give up on him yet don't give up on her yet work those wings together work those wings of your business work those wings of your family hello everyone dr martin williams of ambassadors worship center i want to thank you for tuning in today to this amazing message it's our hope that it wasn't just amazing and that you just learned something but you learned enough and have enough inspiration to go into the world and be that kingdom citizen especially that ambassador that you're called to be because this blessed you so much i want to ask you to do something very important so into this ministry give i'm so excited that we're going to see you next week so until then god bless you